Well, welcome to the show, Nathan. Awesome to have you on and talk some football, talk uh, your coaching um, and touch into your playing days as well. Um, a place I'd love to actually start, and that is in your playing days, was the pre-season where you went from Melbourne to Adelaide, um, so 97-98. Obviously, they were the reigning premiers at the time, um, you know, best team of football, basically. And you managed to start round one the following year to make a debut as a 21-year-old. Can you talk to me about your mindset entering the Adelaide Crows and being the best team and then ultimately getting a starting spot and obviously pushing somebody out of the team who was there the previous game, which would have been a grand final. So would you talk to us about your mindset and and how you went about that preseason to get that uh, spot come round one? Yeah, I mean, you probably got to go 12 months back before that and... Um... You know, I was playing league, started playing league footy at Nord in 94 and then was playing pretty reasonably in 96 when Port were coming into the competition at the end of the year. So sort of expected to be on Port's list at the end of 96 and, and missed out on that, having um, played reasonably well against uh, Port in the finals. And went to the rookie list, obviously, at Melbourne and, and started there. Uh, the rookie list at that stage was late February. So I only got there four days before the season started because uh, we're still negotiating a contract and rookie like clubs women to take interstate rookies Melbourne did but that organized to upgrade me after a couple of weeks so I played the first three games in the Melbourne reserves got upgraded to the senior list after round three uh, and then nearly played my first game of AFL footy in round four that week I broke my sternum uh, playing reserves missed 12 weeks with a broken sternum uh, four weeks after I broke my sternum, I was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. Uh, so it had been kind of a bit of a, a fractured, broken year. But there was certainly, you know, I thought I was ready to play AFL footy the year before. It was more around circumstance that I didn't get there. And then um, coming to the Crows in, in 98, you know, there was, you know, opportunities early in pre-season and, and I took them. Yeah, fantastic. Was there any player that you... Uh sort of followed around during training in the pre-season and sort of tried to replicate what they did or is it you just sort of went about your own business you know what look what good training looked like at that stage of your career and you could just go about improving yeah footy was a vastly different space in the in the yeah. 1990s so there was a little bit less mentoring and, and care for, for the new person <laughs> uh so you, you're sort of hung in there to survive I, I can't exactly say i knew uh what good training habits were like probably for the first six or seven years of my career really uh, but I knew how to try hard when, when I played. So um, I was always capable of that. And I, I certainly thought a lot about football and how it could be better. I didn't always put it into practice. It's interesting, actually. I'm down here coaching. I uh, just sort of joined a little program here in the under-15s, coaching a, a regional team, sort of state competition down here in um, Victoria. And um, we've got, so the 15-year-olds coming into the program, it's a bit like they don't know exactly what, we had to have a big conversation regarding sort of pre-training, what that looks like and getting the fundamentals done. And that, and you just sort of realise at that age, they just don't know what it looks like um, and what's required um, that you might get when you get to say the under-18s at the Coats League or or let alone VFL, AFL. Um, have, have you noticed throughout, I guess, from your playing days and then now to the coaching, still at AFL level, just the continue, continual um, progress that the... Um, the level of football and what's required to prepare for the game and how much it's in, you know, dramatically changed in the sort of 20 years you've been a part of it? Yeah, I don't think there's many sports that prepare people less for AFL footy than AFL. Uh, you know, I think I think one of the great things about AFL is, is kids come back each year. We don't have those big drop-offs in numbers um, because kids, they, they have fun and, and they grow together and, and our expectations on junior footballers isn't much the, the problem we have is we don't have kids that learn a hell of a lot because they train you know this season might be only 14 weeks uh you know training starts two weeks before the season starts they train 16 times a year for one hour and then they play 14 games so the amount of information they gather in that time like we shouldn't expect them to know much uh when they're coming in so um that's always the uh, the challenge for for uh, any any coach at higher levels, is there's some significant gap gaps in their knowledge? Yeah, fantastic. Is um just going back to your playing days too. So you um from being a seventeen year old debuting with uh, Norwood, and then ultimately a few years later playing for Adelaide as a twenty one year old. What sort of progression? 
like you sort of touched on a little bit, was there anything else you did that allowed you to break into the AFL system? Because obviously the draft age, that stage was probably 17 year olds. Most majority of people would come into that age, but you got into there as a, you know, 20, 21 year old ultimately played and had 10 year career. Is there anything you did during that, that sort of stage of your career that you think really helped? Well, I mainly just did a lot of things wrong, which is why it took me so long. Um, at 17, I was going pretty well. You know, I'm playing league footy and, and pretty good league footy yep. as a 17-year-old. Uh, didn't put my name in the draft that year, uh, so it's pretty hard to get drafted. Had a had a stinker of a year the next year with a combination of um, injuries. I mean, I think I got injured playing state cricket, um, had a groin injury, uh, then didn't play that well. My attitude was... Pretty average. I just left high school, didn't know where I was going in the world. And uh, I think I went from the league to the under-19s in eight weeks at one stage. So, you know, I sort of destroyed a year in a way as an 18-year-old, as, as lots of maybe people learning life do. Uh, next year had a pretty strong league year and, you know, probably should have been in the AFL at the end of 96. But uh, I think even the Crows came to me before the pre-season draft because they were going to take me with their first rookie pick. And they were like, oh, we should have drafted you in the draft. We made a mistake. Um, it's pretty unusual to hear a club say that after the draft. Yeah, without a doubt. Is um just jumping forward a bit now and talking about when you jumped into coaching and you pretty much had success straight away there again at Norwood um, in the grand final first year, a couple of premierships a couple of years later. What, what prepared you really well to make that transition from playing in the elite system for 10 years and then going straight in pretty much into a role? Um, were you doing much behind the scenes in terms of any other coaching outside of AFL or is it just your general thought process was, I'm going to coach and just watching how your coaches of the day were doing it and then taking that with you straight into the sample? Yeah, I mean, my passions when I played were helping people. So whether it be my teammates, uh, whether it be... Uh, running programs in schools. I'd, I'd worked with uh, leading teams for about eight years yep. uh, leading up to to being a coach. So I'd, I'd, I'd had the good basics of, of wanting to help people, having a pretty good understanding of, of playing. I mean, I had to, I didn't have any great physical advantages, so I had to learn my way around how best to manage and position myself on, on the footy ground. Um, and, and then, you know, around setting some values and, and reinforcing them uh, within, a, within a club space. I mean, the, there was some, you know, untapped talent at Nord at the time. And, you know, I was also lucky enough to have some really good support coaches at, at local level. I don't know how much you know about South Australian footy history, but it's kind of the Williamses and the Odies are the two sides of uh, football. And, you know, it's almost like the, I don't know, Star Wars sort of dark and the dark and the light and, and, you know, Foss Williams was the kick it and play straight line and, and motivate and be tough. And he coached he coached 10 flags, I think. I, I don't want to get it wrong. I work at Port Adelaide. But I know <laughs> he coached pro and then nine in, in uh, between 1954 and 1965. And then uh, Jack Odie sort of started the handball. Um, and, the, the, and they won five in a row between 66 and 70. And I was lucky enough to have David Odie, his grandson, as uh, one of my uh, junior coaches and I had, you know, Robert Odie, Jack's son as my kicking coach and just had some great coaching conversations and I still catch up, you know, with David. Robert's gone to the other side now, but um, but still catch up with David and, and some of the other coaches that I had at that time at Nord and I was lucky to have some good people around me. Yeah, it is, it is key. We had a, a conversation, I was talking um, a couple of weeks ago on the podcast here, but when you, I know um, you've been in assistant roles so since you come in the AFL system, but when you were a senior coach, just the, talk to us about the importance of getting, um, or, or the importance of how the process of getting some of the great assistants around you. Do you have any advice for coaches out there, whether they're coaching a local club or in the state league, or um, is, is there any advice you have about how to select great assistants and to complement what you are as a coach? Well, I think when you see people that can uh, communicate an idea, and show some care, then that's always a great start. And, you know, I mean, I, I coach an under-12s team as well. I'm a footy director at a school, and you, you're trying to help and support coaches and, and bring out their strengths. And I, I think if you can find those two things, I mean, it, it's – I mean, I was pretty lucky, you know, even if I look at my last coaching box when I was coaching league footy at SNFL, and, you know, I had Andrew McLeod and Stephen Doyle, and I had my brother there, you know, was a, was a good coach. And we, we had, a, you know, Robbie Neal, who was – 
he's an outstanding coach who runs a women's program in in South Australia now. So I was lucky enough to have a lot of good coaches uh, around me, and um, you know, there's, there's a bit of luck involved as well. But if you can find people even at, at, at local level that can hear an idea and then at least manage it, you know, and there's always those those coaches that you go, you know, what they don't mightn't have any great ideas necessarily themselves. But if they can hear your idea and then you can go and, and when they run a training activity, it looks like what you think it should look like, that's a pretty good start. In the elite system now with the AFL, and I know a lot of listeners here, either at state level or coach league or, um, you know, with aspirations, maybe one day to get to the AFL level. Could you walk us through what an average week looks like for you? I know we're trying to pencil it a time for us that's to come um, to for us to talk and i know how busy um guys in your role are could you just sort of walk us through a bit of a, a bit of detail about what an average week looks like for you it particularly as a you know i guess an interstate team to so you're traveling every second week you're right now as we talk it's a saturday morning so i don't have anything really much to do other than the ken hinkley phone call that i just ignored five minutes ago but that's right you can wait you can wait half an hour i hope just, just tell me how uh, more important uh call to make yeah uh, but normally normally it's a pretty quiet day today until game time and then post game it's more the the vision and then the reports post game so that'll be around four hours of work so it's it's getting that in between now and six o'clock on sunday where they're all handed in uh, ken will normally start having a look through them sunday night and then we'll meet uh monday morning 8 30 for probably spend about two hours together go through our areas and then we'll start to catch up with uh, we'll start to look at the messaging. What's our messaging going to be during the week, both for lines but also for the team. Start to work into individual reviews. So then I'll sit with the defenders that played in defence during that week. There's there's normally one, at least one meeting for me to run during the week. Um, this week there's there was three. Uh, my, you know when we when we've got an oppo, we've all got a, a share of oppo teams. Geelong's one of my teams, so uh, that's my responsibility. So it's, it's really like full full days Monday, Tuesday. Thursday, getting a lot of your oppo done Wednesday and your day off, uh, and then Friday morning meetings. Friday afternoon is normally off, which is which is nice. Um, but if we're travelling, which is every second week, well then we're on a plane and we're going somewhere. Amazing. So pretty much we're talking seven days a week, isn't it, during the season? It is. I mean, it's so, I mean, some of the days finish a little bit earlier. So I'm often Tuesday, Thursday. You know, might be a seven thirty start, but I'm done by sort of three three thirty. I mean, I sort of, you know. COVID was tough for coaches, so I'm a footy director at a school, so I'm then off, off and out straight out to school and um, doing some work um, with coaches. And you know, my day off, I was up at Mercedes this week running an education session with some uh, some of the first 18 and of the boys and the girls' teams. But, um, yeah, and then you get to coach your under-12s on Wednesday night as well. It's a full-on role. I'm sure listeners are thinking the same thing. I was watching this um, the good doco. Um, you've probably seen it, might have seen it, but it's on Netflix at the moment called The Quarterback, and it's following the three quarterbacks in the in America there. And uh, I was really interested in Kirk Cousins, um, and he's implemented for the last few years into his schedule to take Tuesdays off during season. And I think at the time he sort of says in the, in the show that, you know, all the coaches were taken aback, you know, what, how could a quarterback not be in the in the room? But he just talked about, you know, um, for him and for his family and that and getting some time away. Do you do you do anything? Do you play golf or anything to get away from the game? Or how do you, um, you your schedule seems jam packed, but do you, how do you sort of unwind a little bit from the stresses of, of coaching? Yeah, for five months, I'm pretty well stuffed, basically. So... Yeah. Um, you know, more more when the, the the school footy stuff and the club footy stuff kicks off alongside my normal job. That's sort of five months so it's super busy. Um during the preseason, the preseason it doesn't sound it doesn't look anything like that. I'd say preseason is a thirty to thirty five hour a week job. Yep. Um and and then you get your two months off at the end of the year. So it's a different sort of balance where you've got the you know, the footy season, which is really intense, like by about now you're starting to feel a little bit cooked. You've got to lie down and have your little meditation session to get a bit of deep breathing in, which I was trying to do Thursday night because, you know, you, you give a lot of yourself during the season and yeah. uh, you're not always getting heaps in return. So uh, you, you've got to sort of give yourself that mindfulness time to, to try and breathe and relax. And I do try and take the dog for a walk on a Wednesday morning. That's my one moment. 
Yeah, perfect. Talk to us a little bit about meditation. I'm actually interested in. I have have done in the past, and I've actually just got back in the process of getting into it again. I just think for myself, um, sort of bringing myself, I guess, into the moment and being, you know, living for now. I sometimes actually looking back a lot of games and in looking forward on on work and and, and things in the future. And uh, sometimes I I personally struggle with. Um, you know, try and be in the moment, especially when you know with you're with your family and and um and and just doing general general things. Is uh what what's it about for you, and and how do you go about it? Uh, well, I, I'm I'm about a, a level one meditator, I think. But you know, I, I do some box breathing. Uh, I look, I understand there's so much research around the value in it, and um, you know, just some just some box breathing for me for a couple of minutes, which is you know sort of four seconds in. Um, four seconds of holding your breath really four seconds out and then just keep working around the square and I can kind of find it on any window or any uh, wall where you sort of just look at the wall and breathe for a minute and it slows your heart rate down a bit and then you can try and stay present yeah great um, just an overall look at your coaching uh, philosophy is there any sort of key principles for you for better and more consistent performance with your with your team and your coaching I think your, your aim is to always help the person be the best version of themselves that they can be. Yep. And, and as long as you understand that, and you know, we're, we're not always dealing with personalities that we, that we love or, or sometimes even like, but our, our responsibility is to help them be the best versions of themselves and help them to keep growing and also understand that they're young people and you only got to look back at yourself and think of yourself as a young person and some of the things you did that weren't so good. And you're like, oh, well, I've probably done that before in my life as well. So you're just trying to help them get better and stay patient as much as you can because um, it, it can take a while to uh, change behaviour. And any specific common coach mistakes you've seen across the journey, whether you're, when you're looking at the juniors or um, even at the elite level, is there anything you see that you might be able to recommend listeners to stay away from? Uh, I think too much information. Like I, I think uh, when we, we start to unload information, I think there's – uh, you know, within specific, uh, specifically around training, like you've got such a limited time where you've got the players, so don't spend all that time talking to them. Uh, I think there's there's great value in having your training activity, stopping briefly and having little freeze moments where you have 10 to 15 seconds where you can coach players during activity and then break and then go straight back into it. Yep. Um, you know, you gotta you got to yell sometimes and your the voice gets a bit hoarse, but... That's okay. That's that's what you need to do. So I think it's it's a and and I think the the preparation too in terms of how we prepare for training. I think there's a little bit too much in AF or in footy in general done on the the fly or, or at last minute in terms of our preparation um, to train, but also our preparation and our messaging at the breaks. You know, to have that time, that couple of minutes before each break, and talk to your coaches around what what are our key themes and the, to take some notes out there so you know. Okay, here are our two to three key messages. What's your mindset around um, weekend performance, game day performance? And say one week you have a great performance, you win by 10 goals. Following week you might get smashed and you lose by 10. What's your thought process as a coach um, the 24 hours after, the 48 hours after, especially when you speak to the players for the first time? Are you... Um, could you talk us through how you handle those different scenarios or you're very even keel with um, and just, just look at the facts and, and, and the game tape and how, how it pans out? What's that look like for you? Yeah, well, you're trying to take the emotion away from the whether it's a win or a loss, but particularly around the loss. Like I, I think the, the win, you're, you're trying to keep the players in that learning uh, phase as much as you can. And, and the challenge with winning too much is that you know, we start to get, you know, we start to think, oh, well, no, we're actually quite good at what we're doing. Um, and even even for us, winning 13 in a row this year, there's some risk involved with winning 13 in a row and there's some behaviours that drift. Uh, you know, we weren't really a team that I didn't think was ready to win 13 in a row. Um, and now it's about recorrecting and getting back on board because all of a sudden a couple of losses is a bit of a shock. Uh, to the system for for a lot of individuals, so you're trying to take out of it as much of the emotion and and, and think about how can I help this person be better? Because like the reality is, like you holding a grudge against a player, what's the point? Like they're you're, you're just trying to help them get better. And what are the what are the things that are going to help that player be better this week that gives us a better result this week? Yeah, fantastic. 
You work with a great coach at the moment, um, obviously, uh, Ken, but um, is there any other coach that you maybe admire or uh, think doing a really good job in the AFL system at the moment? And, and why is that? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot of coaches doing good job, even competition. I think, you know, for Chris Scott to coach a team that's been as consistently successful over a long period of time, and, and particularly to come into a club that, was already successful when he walked in. I mean, they're the that's a that's a as an outsider, that's a that's a really challenging uh, job. You know, I look at the next coach of whoever the next coach of Richmond is and going to be an outsider going into that club would be really difficult. Um, knowing how strong those relationships were and and how much they'll compare the new coach to the last coach. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, McRae's having a. a same as Adam Kingsley in a way, they're, they're having a great little period at the moment, but they're also in that honeymoon period where they haven't had to go through the tougher spell just yet. And, um, you know, the, when that, it'll come at some stage and then, then you learn more about the, those coaches uh, when, that, when that time comes. You know, I, I think Vossi's doing a good job managing expectation and trying to rewrite, you know, what's been a pretty wonky ship at Carlton for, you know, 20 years. And, um, you know, there's a lot off field to manage there. And, you know, I think he's he's doing a good job. Yeah, absolutely. And is just on the playing side, is there a player that you've come across who, in your eyes, sort of exceeded expectations? Um, and if there is a player like that, how do, they, how do you think they did that? I, I think there's there's heaps of them. You know, yep. there is absolutely heaps of them. So I think in my time back to Norwood where, uh, I, you know, I had Tom Jonas when I started there. He was in the under-18s and, uh, you know, his first game playing league footy was maybe round six in my first year there and he played on the wing as a 19-year-old and ended up in the back pocket and, you know, played in a grand final in his first year and got rookie listed to Port. And here we are 12 years later, he's played 213 games and he's mm. been out of captain club. Uh, to Dan Houston, who was rookie pick 45 as a high forward, uh, or got moved to half back late in his first year because he was no good as a high forward. And I remember him coming back after one year, and I was thinking, oh, what's the point in him coming back? Like, uh, but he's grown into being, you know, what should be an all Australian player yeah. this year, and one of the he's like, star. Like he's a, you know, his ability to move whoop, from contest to contest has been. Um, outstanding, and even like little ones, like you know, people you mightn't remember, but remember Alex Giorgio, who played a few games for Melbourne many, many years ago. Oh, so Alex. played no, you don't mean played seven games for Melbourne. Uh, I think the, the, he's had two famous moments. Franklin punched him, and he got a week, and Franklin got a week. Uh, but Alex was a player at Nord that was in the under 18s as an overager when I when I started there, and I remember when he picked him for his first league game, and uh, someone said to me, "It's like oh, you'll never win a game of league footy." Uh, with Alex Giorgio in the side, and you know he played 200 games for Norwood. He ended up captaining the club, played in two flags, and got to play AFL footy. And he was the ugliest footballer you've ever seen in your life. But uh, he played seven games of AFL footy and and had an outstanding career, and uh, he's still playing somewhere up in the hills. Yeah, fantastic. It's actually funny. Speaking of Dan Houston, you might notice I got there. I am a Bombers fan, so it, we don't speak speak too well of Dan Houston this year at the at the Bombers uh, our supporters. <laughs> so <laughs> it's actually funny on that game. I don't know, obviously, what your thoughts, but as a viewer on TV, the moment he didn't kick it to the top of the square, I went, "Oh no!" <laughs> he knows he can kick the distance, and he's pretty yeah. confident. Anyone anyone who had any inkling they couldn't do it would have just bombed it to the top of the square quickly. And I thought, as soon as he sat back and he just looked like he's going to have a shot, I thought, "Oh no, this is not good." Yeah. Yeah, well, I wasn't sure. It would have been awesome it. for you, though. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure he had it in him because I thought he was, you know, we'd sort of been through it before. He's such a beautiful kick. And that was his, always his one his strength. Um, and we were sort of talked about 52 metres as being his distance. But he claims the ball goes further when it's wet. So uh, balls have changed a lot now. I guess they're a bit newer and, and they've, they don't, they're not been sitting in the water for four quarters. So uh, I wasn't sure it got there on the night. But then, yeah, it was, it was a nice little surprise moment. It was, it was, um, I actually reckon, I don't know what your thoughts too, but it's probably the best after the siren goal I've ever seen. I don't think I've seen a better one outside 50 in the wet. Um, Tom Hawkins did one a few years ago against Hawks. Yeah. 
that was it. But I was directly in front, fifty out. Um, yeah, a few others inside fifty. But I think that's probably the best I've seen. I think. Yeah. Inside. Well, mm. I, I think I think in our life, like in our relevant lifetime, I think when you look at the Blighty one when he kicked the top oh, at uh, insane, it? Park in the in the late seventies, and you go, yeah. hang on, a long way out. Yeah, that's a- that, well, that's yeah, that's on another level. <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. So, no, no, that's right. But it was a magnificent uh, kick by Dan. Um, got a few more questions for you. Um, is um with training. Is there any myths or mistakes that you you see with training? I know you mentioned about talking too much. Is there anything else that sort of comes across that you might see, particularly at like local community level or um, state level? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, too many cone activities. Yeah. Like, like just cones are there to create boundaries and and space, not to for people to stand behind. Um, thinking that game type simulations, the players get bored of them. They don't get bored of them. Like they. Like if you give them good small game simulation activities, players will love them. And then we, we're trying to invent new activities all the time. Whereas I reckon you can, in, in, in your pre-season planning, when you actually look at the training sessions that you're going to have, even if you're, you're a two-a-week team, and, and then you go, well, you might only need 10 to 12 activities for the entire year, and that includes small activities. Because yep. um, once you, you know, there's a few players not here that night and a few players, if you can reduce your activities, it means you don't have to explain them all the time. And if they, they simulate things that happen in the game, well, players don't get bored because they're constantly making game game like decisions, and um, they're, they're the the parts where you know I think when coaches have the longer explanations, or they've got to bring in new things, or they've designed some shape. You know, I've been playing a few amateur games a couple of years ago for for charity. I went out to one training session, and every activity was just a different shaped kicking activity, whether it be figure eight kicking or. I was just moving from one cone to the next. I'm like, oh, I don't know. We make up any shape here. It doesn't really matter. Do you have any books or documentaries you might recommend uh, listeners get a hold of? Yeah, there's always a, there's always uh, plenty. I was actually glad I read the notes this morning because I was like, okay, hang on. I've got to do a <laughs> bit of work here. So, uh, look, I, I think you know, I tend to you – know, I'm I very much a, a reader. I loved uh, Sports Gene by David Epstein. Uh, which I think I picked up somewhere in Philadelphia, but it, you, I'm sure you can find it a whole lot more locally than that. Uh, Gridiron Genius, I thought, was a, a great read by Michael Lombardi. Uh, uh, you know, Moneyball is always a great starting point. Bassi, final question. If I gave you a banner that every coach is going to see day in, day out, what would that look like? Yeah, I, I think for, the, for, for me, it, it's helping the players be the best version of themselves uh, each and every day. And and that's what that's what my aim is is to help them be better. And whilst they mightn't always be the exact type of person that you love working with right now, you're trying to help them be the best version of themselves. And um, that's where you where you get up in the morning. And and that it's one of the great things in a, in a way about working with the AFL is you know if you can help people and positively influence them, uh, that they're going to have potentially positive some great positive influence out in the community uh, through the rest of their lives. Um, and, and that's what you're looking forward to do as a coach is you want to help people be better. Right, fantastic. Well, look, really appreciate your time. I know I just walked through your schedule, super busy man. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully I'm sure listeners will actually love our conversation here and hopefully get a lot out of it. All the best for this weekend's game and the rest of the season. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys finish strong. Thank you.